This is a review of the 1964 Lewis Gilbert film, The Seventh Dawn, which stars William Holden and his then lover, Capucine, as well as Susanna York, um, and the prolific Japanese actor Tetsuro Tamba, who made a lot of movies in Japan as well as the United States. Uh, this movie um, is set in the uh, Republic of Malaya, um, which is known today as Malay or Malaysia, um, mostly in 1953, although it begins after the end of World War II. Um, but most of the events uh, take place, well, it begins immediately after, at the end of World War II. Most of the events take place a little bit later in 1953. Movies from 1964, which was just after Malaysia, um, became one uh, country, along with some of the uh, regions in Borneo. Um, immediately, of course, we wonder if Hollywood, <laughs> uh, if we dare watch uh, a movie where Hollywood attempts um, to represent uh, sort of a foreign culture um, in 1964, and you wonder, even now, if uh, Hollywood could make a reasonable movie about international politics, um, about uh, uh, foreign traditions and values, uh, probably not, and the odds of them getting it right in 1964 are even slimmer. But does that mean you should run from this movie? Well, I don't know, maybe. Um, it is a pretty interesting movie and pretty unexpected uh, for some reasons I'll get into. And I actually think that the very beginning of the movie underscores a lot of sort of interesting things about the film. So the movie starts, like many movies, with a credit sequence. And I think the credit sequence is actually done by uh, the person who did a number of the James Bond credit sequences, but I didn't really pay attention to it, and I'd recommend just sort of zoning out because it starts out with just some sort of bland oriental imagery or something along those lines, um, and not really, not really putting the movie off on a great foot. But as soon as that's over, um, the real action begins with uh, some Japanese prisoners being shot. Um, and immediately, you notice a couple of things. For one, the violence at the very beginning of the movie and throughout is much more extreme than you might expect, uh, particularly for a movie from 1964. This movie is actually uh, more violent and more intense um, than I had expected, um, without a doubt. Another thing you notice almost immediately is that this movie was not filmed on a Hollywood backlot, um, and in fact, it was filmed on location in Malaysia. So you get a pretty realistic jungle. Uh, seemingly, you get extras that are really Malaysian. Um, and that actually goes quite a long way and is interesting. Even <laughs> you can, it's hard to even imagine what it would have taken to drag the sort of Hollywood uh, setup out to Malaysia in the 60s to make this movie. Um, but at least that's interesting to think about as you watch the movie. Um, and it's also not entirely uh, just set in the jungle either. You might, you start to think at the beginning um, that this is going to be, yeah, it's just going to show everything. It's sort of this uh, wilderness and jungle and this untapped land. But actually, you get a number of scenes uh, in larger cities later on um, that show a much more sort of developed economy and things that are pretty interesting. And again, a bit unexpected. Um, soon, so this is like I said, the end of World War II, so there's some helicopters flying around announcing that the war is over um, and that the Japanese have surrendered. And meanwhile, there's, there's sort of the last Japanese prisoners are being executed. Um, William Holden is introduced as kind of a good guy who stops one of his Malaysian uh, accomplices from shooting um, a Japanese soldier um, or, or something along those lines. You're introduced to William Holden as some kind of guy who's fighting alongside the Malaysian guerrillas, um, and uh, so is Capucine, which is one of the more ridiculous sights you will ever behold in a movie, and it is extremely difficult to believe um, not only the general sort of origin story of Capucine's character, which is that she was born in Saigon to um, a Vietnamese mother, I guess, and uh, some sort of uh, European father, um, it's not, uh, the, the, the copy of the movie that I had, the print of it was extremely poor. So I wasn't, I wasn't able to tell if there was any particular sort of, uh, like embellishment via makeup, um, of any sort of features to try and sell this like half Asian look that I think would be sort of a crossing a line for some people today. I couldn't, I honestly couldn't tell if that was the case. And it seems like really what they do is they have her put on sort of Orientalist shirts and that's the way that we're meant to believe that Capucine is sort of this half Asian uh, sort of Vietnamese and European origin. 
Um, but even that, beyond even beyond sort of the general thing of her character, just panning across this jungle and seeing her uh, as a gorilla is, yeah, uh, totally ridiculous. It doesn't really make any sense if you know anything about um, the sort of roles that she usually plays um, and who she is. Although later on, um, you maybe get more in touch with what you would expect um, from her character. So a couple of unexpected things already, but it just keeps getting better because it turns out that um, there are actually three sort of main players in this movie, and it's a trio who have been fighting together um, with the guerrillas in this war. Ng, N-G, Vietnamese, um, is the third um, of the trio, and he's played by Tetsuo Tamba. Uh, they've been fighting together at the war, but when the, once the war ends, um, you see them at a train station discussing their future plans, and essentially the way it breaks down is that um, William Holden, Ferris is his name in the movie, uh, is planning to buy up a huge rubber, a huge plot of land and start a rubber farm and get really rich, uh, which is interesting look, um, sort of maybe a new type of uh, uh, capitalist colonialism almost um, that he slides into. Donna, that's Capucine, is going to become a school teacher, okay, and Ng is going to go to Moscow to study. Uh, so here you're introduced to another big theme of the movie, which is capitalism versus communism. That's kind of uh, sets the scene, sets the stage for, for everything. Um, but uh, there's a couple of really interesting things happen in this scene in the train station. For one, um, we see that there really is a deep friendship uh, between all three. But beyond that, it's even implied that there's a romantic relationship between Ng and Capucine, which is unexpected for a movie uh, from sort of 1964 to have Capucine, who usually is sort of this sign of uh, really patrician, highbrow, um, aristocratic beauty and whatnot. To have her have sort of an implied romantic relationship with someone who is not white is a bit unexpected, and it starts to position this Ng character differently how, than how you might expect. So the movie mainly goes on. Like I said, this, this capitalism versus communism thing is a big theme um, of the movie, and it turns out when we come back in 1953, um, it turns out that Ng has returned to Malaysia and is the head of the terrorists, um, which is what they call the communist um, sort of insurgents, I guess, um, who are uh, fighting sort of guerrilla warfare in um, Malaysia against the British uh, regime that has stayed on after the war. And uh, William Holden is ostensibly... Uh, starts out sort of trying to be neutral, but basically gets recruited by the British um, to represent their interests. Now, this might seem like sort of a very middle-of-the-road kind of Cold War era capitalism versus communism plot line, which would not be interesting at all and would not be worth watching a movie uh, about, in my opinion, usually. But, like I said, the way that Ng is positioned as a character really throws a monkey wrench into some of this. Now, I will say, one minor side note that's kind of humorous, I think, is that you see all of the Japanese soldiers uh, being killed off in the beginning, and then you're introduced to this Ng character who, like I said, is supposedly Vietnamese, but he's played by a Japanese actor who looks extremely Japanese. And it's a little bit, uh, yeah, it's a, it, 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 yet another time where uh, sort of the, the casting um, of the movie is a bit uh, hard to believe. But um, otherwise, Tetsuro Tamba does, you know, a decent job, I guess. Um, of playing what uh, Hollywood's idea of just sort of some uh, blanket Asian character is, I guess. Um, and, you know, Malaysia is eh, close to Japan, I guess. <laughs> Not really. But, um, you know, uh, that's kind of the, the standard uh, that you have to expect uh, from movies of that time. Not to say that it's good. Um, and it might be, you know, might be sufficient reason not to, not to watch the movie at all. But um, that's up to you. The, the point is, is that rather than having a sort of very black and white, uh, communist bad, capitalist good sort of plot line. Um, Ng is actually set up as a character who is a friend of Capucine and William Holden and who is potentially a former lover of Capucine and whatnot. And that really complicates things. And as things, as the movie progresses and the conflict, uh, the tension escalates and whatnot, these relationships are put under a lot of tension, but... I don't really want to spoil the movie, but let, let me just say, it, it complicates it, and it makes it, in my opinion, a much more complex depiction of the scenario than you would expect. So, I think I've already touched on some of the uh, issues with the movie in terms of really just hard-to-believe casting, um, some sort of oversimplified cultural 
uh, depictions and whatnot, there are also some unexpected strengths of the movie. And one of them is the complexity of the conflict, and another one is the intensity of the conflict. So I touched on that already by mentioning that the beginning is more violent than you might expect. That continues. And as an action movie, this is actually surprisingly gripping. Um, yeah, surprisingly gripping with uh, all kinds of, you know, whether it's hand-to-hand -hand combat, whether it's sort of suspenseful uh, terrorist antics, um, or whether it's just running through the jungle. Uh, you really have it all. It's, it's really a pretty solid, like, action and adventure um, kind of movie. It also, like I said, has an interesting view of the conflict itself. And this is maybe most clearly shown in its sort of ambivalence towards the British, who are not the, really the good guys um, in this movie. Or you might argue that... You might argue that... Uh, um, that... Uh, I guess I would say a very literal interpretation of some of the plot elements might suggest that the, the British are supposed to be the good guys, but it's fairly clear that that's not where the heart of the movie um, or the views of the filmmakers lie um, exactly. So like I said, Ng has this uh, history, this friendship um, and love for the characters and whatnot that is reciprocated, um, and the British are not exactly the good guys. Um, that really puts an interesting spin on some of the conflicts, and for the most part, it this movie totally avoids sort of facile um, uh, understandings of how you might circumvent uh, the conflict after the war. It's interesting, too, because this is sort of an uncommon movie in some ways, and that it's a, sort of a war movie, but it's set after a war, which is a mature, uh, a more mature perspective on conflict than might arise. In fact, the British start out, they try to recruit William Holden to help them by saying that they, in fact, have mutual interest with the terrorists, read communists, um, because they want Malaysian independence and whatnot. So the British start out by claiming they want independence, but this ends up not really, um, nobody really takes them seriously about this. Nobody believes that. And already we start to see that the movie's operating in pretty different territory from a war movie um, that might have two very well-defined sides and whatnot, where allegiances might be strong and where the drama um, doesn't really include an ideological uncertainty about motivations of characters and about the uh, best way to proceed from a moral ground. Well, this movie has a lot of ideological uncertainty about who is right, about what is practical, and about what should be done. And this is in part uh, really amped up by William Holden's character being sort of a classic uh, looking after himself um, kind of surly um, sort of neutral American and whatnot or he's Australian in the movie, although, of course, nobody has the right accent in this movie, so even though uh, William Holden and Capucine are supposed to be Australian, they obviously don't, yeah, they don't have Australian accents, but whatever. Um, the, you know, he's the sort of the surly outsider type, is the point, point. Um, and that gives you a perspective on things that is quite different from uh, sort of the colonial perspective that the British might have. Now, this, uh, um, I, I'm mentioning details here to talk about how uh, the movie has a different perspective, but it's not subtle um, in the movie. And I don't want to spoil some of the things that happen later on in the movie because they are honestly extremely surprising. I really did not expect uh, what happens in this movie. Um, but let's just say that it is the complications and the snags and the uncertainty of what to do in this uh, sort of power vacuum after uh, the war is... Yeah, it's, it's not subtle. And the movie, I think, actually makes a really strong impression for the sorrows of a conflict like this and just for the, the um, rough situation that arises where a lot of parties are in the wrong um, and whatnot. And that is quite a bit different from what you first think uh, when you hear about the movie basically being a proxy for capitalism versus communism. Um, it's a lot more complicated than that. Now, at the same time, let me read you a quotation from the poster uh, of this movie. It says, A strange land sleeps like a beautiful woman, so still, so mysterious, so untouched, until the first light of dawn awakens the passion of men and the furies of war. What the hell does that mean? I mean, you read that, you think, do not watch this movie. So outdated and uh, cheesy and just cringeworthy, um, really. And the reality is this, this movie also contains many, many moments that are just insane. The introduction of Susanna York's character, for instance, is <laughs> hard to, yeah, it's, 
it's crazy. Um, it's it's hard to imagine what the hell the people making this movie were thinking um, in that portion. Well, it's not really hard to imagine what they were thinking is that they wanted to take very traditional, proven money-making elements from Hollywood blockbusters and import them into Malaysia um, and whatnot and just stick them into this adventure story, even if it is totally out of place and just leads to a bizarre uh, tone and insane plot. Um, so there are a number of moments throughout where there are sort of romantic undertones where they have no right to belong and just make no sense um, whatsoever. Of course, there are relationships now that just seem crazily um, inappropriate <laughs> and whatnot. Um, and of course, another thing that's uh, that's that's totally belied by this title is that, of course, it's a very token, very simplified view um, of Malaysia and whatnot. Now, it is sort of a, a romantic view as well, right? It's a strange land sleeps like a beautiful woman. Okay, you can just imagine sort of the way that it's um, portrayed. Now, that said, like I said, actually shooting the movie on location is pretty interesting and I think pretty cool, um, but that does not mean that this movie is like super authentic or anything. They do make some attempts at showing sort of local culture and whatnot, and frankly, I don't know how uh, authentic it, it is, uh, but I suspect not very. <laughs> um, of course, you know, the, the real dramas are, even though uh, the Malaysian people are really sort of at the center, hypothetically, of this movie, all of the sides of it are actually um, acted out uh, by um, the white actors and whatnot, and Tetsuro Tamba and whatnot. They sort of represent each of the ideological positions, right? So Donna, who is the school teacher, basically becomes the proxy for um, the Malaysian people who essentially don't have a voice um, in this movie or who occasionally speak through their servants um, and whatnot. So, yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, this movie, total, total mess. Um, but, like I said... It does have some sort of surprising virtues, which is a more complex conflict um, than you might expect, where the movie is really not sort of a cookie-cutter war movie. Um, it's a it's a complex situation with a lot of wrong moves um, made uh, and a lot of difficult choices. And like I said, the way that the plot actually goes is totally unexpected and leaves uh, left a lasting impression um, on me uh, for reasons that you, I think you would instantly understand um, if you watched it. Like I said, it's also a pretty intense movie, so there's um, some of the uh, attacks, um, some of the uh, uh, actions taken by the British are intense, um, and that lends a certain sort of oomph uh, to the movie. So overall, <laughs> I'm not sure I can give sort of a rousing recommendation for The Seventh Dawn. I think that odds are most people uh, would probably be turned off by some of its uh, quirks um, and some of its uh, elements. Um, that said, it in some ways is a pretty strong movie. Um, so it, I don't know, it might be something to watch um, if if you're sort of interested in it, or if you want to see um, a movie that's filmed in Malaysia on location in the '60s. Um, it had some pretty interesting. The jungle scenes maybe not so interesting, but it had some pretty interesting um, more urban scenes. I'm not sure what city um, they were filmed in. Probably Kuala Lumpur. Um, yeah, some pretty uh, some pretty interesting scenes um, there, and overall, uh, a fairly gripping movie uh, if you're not totally put off by some of the uh, borderline insane uh, elements, uh, including some of uh, Susanna York's characters and some of the romantic subplots in the movie that just seem uh, totally uh, out of place and bizarre. Um, so that's uh, The Seventh Dawn from 1964.